Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor, and today we are talking about a new book that just came out last week, Loving God's Children, The Church and Gender Ideology, and I have the author, John Birch, with me today to discuss it. John Birch is uh, serves as vice president of Appellate Advocacy for Alliance Defending Freedom, which is short for ADF, if you ever see that in the news. It, it, it defends religious liberty, free speech, parental rights, marriage, and family, and the right to life. And he has argued in front of the Supreme Court on, I think, 11 times, uh, and as well as a member of the Legatus chapter in uh, Grand Rapids. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Very happy to be here. So could you give us sort of an understanding of how you got to writing this book? I mean, you're a lawyer. You've argued in front of the Supreme Court. How did you come to writing this book? Yeah, I can tell you that when I went to law school, I never had the intention of writing a book about gender ideology. Uh, that's one of those things that just kind of happens to you along the way uh, as part of God's plan. And uh, what really was the motivator for it was the way that my litigation was progressing at Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, we are the world's largest law firm uh, de defending free speech, religious liberty, parental rights, marriage and family, the right to life. Uh, but what I found over the last five years or so was that in the religious liberty and free speech areas in particular, that an increasingly large amount of our docket was dedicated to gender ideology issues. Um, it started with uh, the, the gender identity issues in the privacy spaces of schools and homeless shelters and things like that, where boys identifying as girls wanted access to showers and locker rooms or overnight facilities and things like that. Um, then it expanded into athletics. And then the next thing we knew, um, public employers were trying to force people to use preferred pronouns instead of sex-based pronouns, even if they thought the preferred pronouns were a lie about a, a person's sex. Um, we ended up with issues of all kinds of nonprofits, religious organizations that want to be able to hire in ways that are consistent with their faith beliefs and laws involving gender identity. We're starting to conflict with those. Um, so it's just the, the, a large variety of ways. And so it caused me to learn a lot more about the science, which is a, a big part of the book. Uh, but even more than that, to step back and look at the big picture and ask the questions, well, is this this movement good for people who have gender dysphoria? Is it something that we should embrace or is it something that we should resist or, or at least pause and think about? And that included looking at the Catholic Church's teachings about this issue um, and where theology and the Church's teachings on human sexuality led us. And so as a, a result of that exploration, um, I started giving talks at my parish and then other parishes and then at some diocesan events and uh, started putting my thoughts down on paper and the next thing you know, I, I was pretty well on my way towards writing a book. Uh, so I, I went and finished the job and Sophia Institute Press was kind enough to publish it for me. And, and the whole idea is really to be a guide for someone like me at the beginning of that process. Um, you, you don't have to have a law degree. You don't need to be a medical professional to understand the book, uh, but something that you can just pick up and start to understand uh, how we should think about gender ideology, how we should treat other people, what the church teaches, what science tells us, how culture is influencing these things, um, you know, and, and ultimately what God is calling us to do with respect to these individuals and, and the movement. And so that's what I try to accomplish. Yeah, this book is very important for anybody dealing with children or, you know, in schools or, you know, any institution that might be trying to force uh, gender ideology. On, as well as parents uh, who are going to be dealing with this nonsense. So w w there's a link in the description. Go get the book at Sophia Institute Press. Uh, we want to support our good Catholic publishers. Uh, also, one of the cool things about your career is that you argued a Burgerfell at the Supreme Court. Uh, what, what was that like? Well, it was an incredible honor to be able to represent the church's teaching on marriage in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, at the time I was arguing on behalf of the state of Michigan, there were four uh, marriage cases that were all consolidated in Obergefell. Um, the, the case took its name from the Ohio case, uh, but I, I argued the case on behalf of all four states through Michigan. Uh, and 
we kind of knew going in what was going to happen. Um, that's the, like, maybe the subject for a whole nother podcast. Uh, but between some of the things that the Supreme Court had been doing with cases before ours and clerks that Justice Kennedy had um, had hired that term and just other things where you could kind of um, you know read the, the writing on the wall, uh, we pretty much knew going in that the court was going to make up a right to same-sex marriage. Um, and, and I say make up intentionally because the U.S. Constitution is silent about marriage. And uh, just 30 years before Obergefell, people don't realize this, there was another case out of the Minnesota Supreme Court raising the exact same claims to a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And there, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously denied review of the Minnesota State Supreme Court uh, uh, cert petition. Uh, the decision and uh, specifically said in it for lack of jurisdiction. They don't usually put that in a cert petition denial. What that means is all nine justices agreed that there was nothing in federal law that had anything to do with defining marriage. That was something that the states should decide, um, which of course was our primary argument that the case was not about the best way to define marriage, but it, it's who gets to decide that question. Is it the federal government or nine unelected justices, or is it the people in each state acting through democratic processes? Um, so I, I was very proud to, to make the case for why it was a democratic decision and why it was a, a loving, reasonable belief for people, um, obviously including Catholics, to believe that marriage can only be between one man and one woman, that the state has no interest in any kind of relationship that doesn't ever have the, the possibility of creating a, a child, creating new life. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it was important that we stood for the truth in that case so that people will look back on that historically and see that we were standing for the truth. And in addition, um, the percentage of people who thought the Supreme Court should decide the case plummeted by more than 10 percent nationally after I argued the case. And so, you know, at least we made some headway with with that as well. Um, but you know, that was kind of the, the case that set me on the road to being more interested in litigating religious liberty, free speech, and life cases. And, uh, and that, in a sense, was a starting point for me to get to this book. Almost kind of a sort of an opposite version of a slippery slope, kind of, which is kind of what's been happening. You know, you, st you start with uh, arguments on same-sex marriage, and then you know, you get to uh, gender ideology cases or transgender cases, such which you also argued uh, Harris Funeral Home uh, versus Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. You know, you argued both cases and, you know, in a way, and that l obviously led you to uh, arguing the second. Yeah, it, it did. And you make a really important point about how, how the slippery slope led from one to the other, because that was intentional. If we back up and we look at the history of Obergefell, as I just indicated, th there was nothing in the Constitution that changed in those 30 years. It still was silent as to how to define marriage. But what had changed was the culture uh, through the use of movies and books and television shows and all kinds of other things. Uh, Hollywood and the media had done a, a really good job of promoting same-sex marriage and naturalizing it as something that people should support. They did lots of public opinion polling and they found out what PR campaigns worked the best, uh, the best way to portray people. Um, it, it certainly wasn't with common facts like uh, the, the percentage of people with same-sex attraction who get married is actually very low, that their relationships tend to be very short and unstable, um, that you had the whole HIV and AIDS crisis you know, they didn't focus on that. It was the love is love slogan. So they, they were really good at that. So you get to 2015. Um, I argued Obergefell in April and the decision by the Supreme Court came down in June. And as soon as that opinion came down, again, with most people expecting that Justice Kennedy would be the fifth vote to create a right to same sex marriage that doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. They were already coming out with the Bruce Jenner transition, where he declared himself to be a woman. He took on a new identity, Caitlyn Jenner. Um, already at that point, um, you had uh, I Am Jazz, the uh, young boy who uh, claimed that he had a female identity, and that was a popular television show, and it was getting turned into a children's book. And so the progressive um, advocacy groups immediately pivoted, like, you know, within days from Obergefell to a transgender agenda. And that's why we've seen things moving so fast from 2015 to today, that it was all part of a, a planned change in direction. Once they got marriage, now they wanted to 
eliminate differences between the sex and any human sexual identity whatsoever. And so that's, that's where we are today now, where that agenda has gone faster than anyone could have imagined, uh, progressive or conservative or, or otherwise. And we see all these cultural conflicts where you either jump on board with the trans agenda and you agree that male and female have no meaning and that everyone can just profess whether they're a boy or a girl or both or neither or something in between, or you're considered to be hateful and bigoted and someone who should be pushed out of public society. You know, maybe if you want to have these beliefs in your church or your synagogue or your mosque, you can do that. But don't even think about taking these views into the workplace, into uh, the government, uh, into any other area of public life, because we hate you for that. Um, and, and it was all a, a slippery slope that was enabled by our media and by Hollywood and helped along in large part by many government officials, um, including in two presidential administrations. We hate you for that, but love is love, all right? Like right. The, the, um, that uh, contradiction. And so would you say that sort of basically shows that slippery slope was indeed not a fallacy? Yeah, I, I think it did. Um, it also proved another point that we were making, which is that recognizing a previously unheard of right to same-sex marriage would have drastic consequences for many, many people. And, and what the progressives and the left kept saying in the lead up to that argument is that same sex won't, uh, marriage won't hurt anybody else. It only affects the people who want to be in the relationship. You know, and that lie was first exposed, that oral argument, when one of the justices asked the U.S. Solicitor General, uh, the, the, their top lawyer who was working for President Obama, and they, they asked him whether recognizing same sex marriages would impact nonprofit um, tax designations. You know, charitable organizations like like churches and other nonprofits have tax deductions. Well, if they decline to recognize a same sex marriage, could that have an impact on them? And I think kind of to everybody's shock, the solicitor gender, general candidly said, well, yes, it, it might affect that someday. Well, it turned out that it, it doesn't just impact nonprofits, but it impacts, um, you know, colleges and their dormitories. Uh, you know, it impacts um public accommodation laws across the spectrum. Anybody who doesn't get along with the agenda now is getting impacted by it. Um, so same-sex marriage affected everybody, not just the couples who desired to get married. And it's turning out to be the same way with the transgender movement, that you can't escape it, you can't get away from it. If you're having any kind of a, a life in public, um, whether that means owning a business or working for one, going to school, um, it's going to confront you in some way. And so the slippery slope turned out to be true, and the promise that this wouldn't affect anybody else turned out to be blatantly false. Yes, this whole thing that uh, just the ability to do something was all that was on the line in these Supreme Court cases is ridiculous because it's it's more so like it's become sort of a, a determiner of what is allowable opinion. Right. And, and, and where you see that with the, the trans movement in particular um, is when the Catholic Church started to be very vocal on the, the point. I, you know, I start the book um, with 2019 when the Vatican releases a document intended for schools and educators to help them understand the church's thinking on human sexuality. And, and the document is really beautiful because it made clear that we want to discourage you know, bullying or any kind of ostracization for those who claim a gender identity different than their sex. But at the same time, it makes crystal clear that Catholic educators and schools cannot accept the lie that the body is just a shell that can be manipulated any way that you want. Um, that in fact, we're embodied souls and that the physicalness of our body in some way expresses who we are and that the gift that God gave us to be male or female, which I, I hope we can explore in, in greater depth, mm -hmm. um, that, that when you reject that gift, you're rejecting God and you're hampering your ability to have um, close relationships with other people um, and then ultimately bringing harm to yourself as well. So in response to that truthful, extremely loving document, uh, the New York Times immediately came out with an article condemning the, the church's views as hateful and bigoted. And so that really drew the line in the way that we've been talking that, um, you know, either you accept the movement's precepts, which is that um, sex is just a construct and that gender can be whatever you want it to be. Um, and that it doesn't matter if boys run on girls track teams or go in their showers or their locker rooms, 
or you're a hateful bigot, which is where they squarely put the Catholic Church. And that's why it's so important that uh, all of us learn more about the issue, learn more about how the church teaches us to talk about the issue, understand the science and all the cultural influences, and be able to have those conversations with our kids and our coworkers, our extended family members and others. Uh, because we, as Catholics, we want to love well, you know, and love doesn't mean the the squishy, sentimental, romantic feelings that we see so often in, in movies and on TV shows. Um, but love is the way the catechism of the church defines it, which is to will the best of another person. And you can't will the best of another person if you move forward in a relationship without total truth and honesty about what's good and what's bad for them. Um, you know, that's why you, you can't have a, a loving relationship with an alcoholic without telling them that that alcohol is hurting them and could result in them ultimately dying or maybe hurting someone else in a, a tragic car accident. Um, we, we need to speak truthfully if we want to be loving. In, indeed. Now, it's interesting, sort of, uh, or I guess it's important to get the basics. So could you explain specifically what gender ideology means? Yeah, so the whole notion of gender identity is this concept that we feel a gender in our head, which is different than our bodily sex. And it, it could be a boy who identifies as a girl or a girl who feels like she's a boy. Um, but there are so many gender identities, we can't even count them anymore. Um, Facebook used to give you categories where you could check the box and, and they got to about 70 or 80 and people were still saying that didn't cover all the gender identities. And so finally they just changed it. And now it's a fill in the blank where you get to define your own gender identity. Uh, but you know, even just sticking with the most basic thing, uh, you know, boys who identify as girls or girls who identify as, as boys, it's a difficult concept to wrap your head around because on the one hand, they say that your bodily sex doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're born as a boy or a girl, your gender identity is different, but yet they insist that your body has to be changed to conform to one sex or the other so that it'll fit your mind. You know, so, so right from the, the get-go, there's a, a contradiction in the definition. Uh, so, so where does this notion come from? Well, it was primarily pushed by a psychologist uh, many years ago, back in the 50s and 60s. His name was John Money, um, which is kind of ironic given how much money there is for gender clinics and Planned Parenthood, one of the, the biggest gender clinics in the United States. Um, that they get from prescribing uh, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and performing surgeries and things like that. Uh, but, but he was kind of obsessed with this idea that we could have a gender identity different than our physical sex. And um, his, his foremost experiment, and he had several of them, involved two twin boys. And one of them, his genitals had been disfigured in a circumcision surgery. It was just an accident. Um, and so he advised the parents that they should raise the boy as a girl without telling him that. And so they, they went forward on that basis. So now you have twins, one's a girl and one's a boy. And he pointed to them and, and the way that they progressed as evidence that there is a gender identity that's separate than sex and that we should um, allow kids, adolescents, teenagers, and adults to pursue their gender identity, even if it's different than their sex. Um, and what he didn't disclose, but what one of the twins did, the, the one who had been transitioned to a girl, was that he was um, engaging in all kinds of sexual abuse and forcing the, the young kids to have sex acts and things like that, um, that caused all kinds of mental distress and ultimately caused the, the boy who had had the, the surgery um, that went so wrong uh, to commit suicide. And, you know, that boy's comments about what had happened to him, uh, John Money treated a lot of the, of the same way that um, that activists treat people today on these views. He said that, uh, that the twin was just biased and hateful towards trans people, even though he had tried to make the boy a, a trans person. Um, so, you know, you fast forward today um, and, and this gender identity concept is being pushed at every level of government, in our public schools, in our, our businesses, Fortune 500 companies, you know, it, it's kind of everywhere. Uh, but that's the foundation for where it came from and how it's defined. What happened to the other twin? Um, he had all kinds of mental health issues as well. Um, I, I don't believe that he committed suicide, but the outcome was not a, a good one for either of the twins or for other subjects of the studies that um, Professor Money um, kind of pioneered. Um, you know, as a result of his early research, uh, John Hopkins 
had one of the very first gender transition clinics anywhere in the United States. And after several years of operation, um, they shut it down because it became obvious to them that the outcomes were not good for their patients and were often causing more harm than good. And, and another subject that I hope we get into is that the, the modern science shows the same thing, that for those who transition fully, um, that their mental health outcomes and their rates of suicide actually increase, which shows that um, allowing someone to pursue uh, trans identity can be one of the most dangerous, unloving things that you can do. Yeah. So what is the level of suicide rate amongst uh, those who transition versus those who don't? Yeah. Well, let, let's start with someone who is diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And, and just to be clear about that, that's a, a clinical, psychological um, uh, you know, uh, a diagnosis where the person has a, a mental image of themselves, which is so at, you know, difference or in conflict with their actual body uh, that it causes them psychological pain, that they feel uncomfortable. And, um, you know, then there, there's different ways that you can treat that. Among that population, and now we're excluding people who, for social reasons, might transition. You know, there's now well documented um, in books and other places that, for example, teenage girls will come out. You know, like 12 of them in a single class at a time will all declare that they're boys and you know they're, they're transgender. There's a social contagion aspect. So now we're sticking just with the people who actually have the psychological diagnosis of gender dysphoria. They have a suicide rate that is 12 times the general population which is horrible, which is why anyone who expresses that kind of distress needs our companionship. We need to walk alongside them as Catholics. We need to be loving and need to try to get them help to resolve some of the underlying psychological issues that may have led to that. Um, I, I saw a figure recently that 60% of that population experienced some kind of childhood sexual abuse. So, so you have to deal with those issues if you want that person to ultimately get better, if you want to truly love them. So, so your question was, well, how about the ones who transition? So for an adult who's, who's gone all the way and, and they've had the surgery, you know, which doesn't actually change their sex because every cell in their body is still coded in a way that any biologist would know if they were male or female, but that they've gone all the way through the transition. So now they, they look and they act like the opposite sex. Um, the best evidence that we have is a long-term study from Sweden, which compared people who did and did not transition, you know, who had gender dysphoria. And what they discovered was that over long periods of time, that the suicide rate went from 12 times to 19 times. So more than 50% again, higher for the people who fully transitioned. And they also found that other incidents of mental health problems increased as well. And that's aside from all the, the physical downsides of using things like puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, you know, which obviously result in permanent infertility, but also can cause loss of bone density and um, disrupting development and, and all kinds of other things. So, you know, even leaving those physical things aside and just looking at suicide and mental health outcomes, it's much worse. And what you'll often hear trans activists say is that um, people who go through a transition are happier. Well, typically it's because they've got very small um, surveys that they're looking at. They're self-selected, you know, where people are given an opportunity to respond or not. And so, of course, the people who support transitions are going to be responding and those who had a, a terrible experience with it will not be. Uh, but most importantly, they're all of short duration. You know, there was even one in the news from the University of Michigan with breast removal surgery recently. And, and they said it was a long-term study. Well, their study was only three to five years. And this, this Swedish study was over a 30-year period. Um, and, and Sweden, along with other European countries, was one of the leaders in transition medicine, if you want to call it that, you know, at, at the beginning of this movement. Um, and, and so it wasn't like trans people in those countries were being, uh, you know, treated poorly or stigmatized or anything like that. They were being embraced and they were being given medical transition. Uh, but, but even in those cultures over long periods of time, uh, the, the scientists are finding that they have poor outcomes. And so that naturally asks or begs the question that you would ask, you know, why would that be? Well, in any other area of mental health where someone has a disconnect or a dissonance between their mind and their body, we treat it by aligning the mind with the body, not the other way around. So for example, if someone has anorexia um, and they, they have this mistaken belief that they're too fat when actually their bodies are just right or often cases too thin, 
um, we would never ask that person to lose more weight, to stop eating, to go through a surgery, to further reduce their weight, because that's not going to solve the underlying mental health issue. And ultimately, it's going to cause big problems for them and potentially even death. Or in the same way, there, there's a, another mental health issue called a body dysmorphia, where someone you know, similar to the, the gender dysphoria feels like a part of their body doesn't believe there or belong there. And it can be very distressing. Like, you know, they, they think their right arm shouldn't be part of their body and they would do almost anything to get rid of it. Well, no self-respecting doctor would remove their arm or, you know, worse yet, hand them a, a tool so they could take the arm off themselves. No, we would try to deal with the, the dysphoria by aligning the mind with the body. And it turns out that gender dysphoria is the only mental health issue where, um, where, where doctors and psychologists are encouraging people to align their body with the mind rather than the other way around. You know, and it, it makes sense that because you can't actually change the sex of the body, as I mentioned, you're, you're going to be coded um, you know, with, with chromosomes that will tell everybody what sex you are, male or female, for the rest of your life, that you can't change the body enough where you can solve the mental health dissonance. Um, so common sense teaches us exactly what the long-term scientific studies show us. Yeah, very interesting. Also, w would John Money have just said that those people who committed suicide, with the you know size, you know the the almost the double or the rate that people who didn't transition, would he have just said that they also were an like anti-trans? In presumably, that that would be his position, um, which but is just unbelievable. But he transitioned the, that boy who didn't know what was going on. And these people, I would assume, transitioned either at an adult or near an adult phase of their life and probably knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah, it, it was with their full consent. And, you know, what, what, what's really scary and, and frustrating about the current environment is that we went from a place you know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, where those transitions were primarily happening with adults who could give full consent, you know, all the way down to small children now who are being given puberty blockers before they even reach the age of puberty, if they express, you know, even a, a temporary um, feeling that they might be a, a gender different than their sex. And, and no child at that age can consent to something like that. Their parents shouldn't be able to consent to something like that, uh, because they don't even understand human sexuality or, or what it means to feel like a, a man or a woman. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and yet you're sending them down this path that's going to result in long-term harm and a lifetime of, of difficulty. And, and what's really frustrating about that is that if, if you look at a, a, a young person, an adolescent or a teenager who is experiencing gender dysphoria, again, we're not talking about the, the social contagion. We're just talking about the clinical diagnosis that 80 to 95% of them, if they are not affirmed and just left to their own devices, will naturally align their mind with their body. And that makes sense because I don't know about you, I've never met an adolescent or a teenager yet who's comfortable in their body. Going through puberty is a really difficult time. And we all have moments where we're uncomfortable with what's happening to our body, where we feel emotional, where we feel anxious, where we have difficulty with our relationships with other people. And what in the past was all considered just a normal part of development, you know, now they're saying, oh, that means that you're trans. Let's get you on the puberty blockers and the cross-sex hormones. So, so 80 to 95% of them will just resolve. But nearly 100% of the kids who are affirmed, in other words, will use your preferred pronouns, will let you dress as the opposite sex, will let you use the opposite sexes, uh, shower facilities and locker rooms and, and things like that. We'll, we'll embrace all of that. Nearly 100% of them will persist, continue to have their gender dysphoria. You know, so, so we're setting these kids up for a lifetime of hardship, even when we start with something as seemingly innocuous as the preferred pronouns, which is why the, the church speaks out so forcefully uh, against using preferred pronouns, because they tell a lie about someone and ultimately they lead to this road that will hurt them. It's it's really crazy. You, uh, you brought up the fact that like if someone believes that if someone has a sort of a belief about their body that they shouldn't have an arm and, or, or something like that, there's no like we wouldn't be uh, advocating for that to be removed or uh, any of the eating disorders. But, you know, it's OK to uh, lop off genitals because somebody doesn't feel like they match how they feel. It's, it's just that that contradiction is crazy. Yeah, it, it's inexplicable, especially when those feelings are based on a, a child or an adolescent's 
um, you know, beliefs about what it feels like to be a member of the opposite sex. You know, if, if you're a boy who's 13 years old, um, you have no conception about what it means to feel like a girl. You, you've never been a girl. You've never been a woman. Uh, you know, so it's based on gross stereotypes about what girls are and how they feel. And, and you know, you, you go back not very long ago, and if a girl wanted to play sports or if she wanted to climb trees, if she wanted to wrestle, be rough and tumble, you know, th then we would embrace that because girls can do anything. And so they, if they want to do those things, you know, more power to them. And now we would tell that same girl, oh, you want to do things that only boys do. So therefore you must be a boy. Here's some, some medication. It's a puberty blocker. And then we'll give you cross-sex hormones and turn you into a boy. Um, th there's just no common sense or scientific sense behind an approach like that. Yeah. And uh, one of the leading uh attackers of gender ideology are actually are feminists because they're seeing uh, what they built being sort of broken down and being brought like brought in, brought biological men into the spaces that they created for themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how that uh, that portion of the LGBT movement has kind of diverged um, that, that there's a very strong feminist group that says we fought for half a century to make sure that girls had equal rights and that they could do everything that boys could do. And now as soon as we've achieved that, that place of nearing equality, you're saying that anyone can declare themselves to be a girl, even if they're not, um, and, and taking away the rights that we had earned for ourselves. And, and so, yes, there's a, a pretty strong conflict between those two. Um, and and I, I might add, you know, strong conflicts between all this ideology and what the church teaches us about how we should think about our human sexuality. Yeah, let, let's get into more about the church's view on uh, sex and body and soul. So how does the church see the relationship of body and soul? Well, um, I think uh, Pope Francis has spoken about this beautifully, uh, as well as St. Pope John Paul II and his theology of the body, uh, that our, our bodies are embodied souls, as we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, you know, there was this heresy all the way back in the second century called Gnosticism. Um, and it arose out of the difficulty some people had with believing that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead body and soul. Uh, you know, for some Christians, they could understand how his soul could raise from the dead, but it didn't make sense to them how a body could raise from the dead. And so they separated those two and said, that must not be what happened. Um, and there's, a, you know, those strains of Gnosticism in today's gender ideology that somehow... Our, our bodies are just cages that we're trapped in and that our souls are something that are independent. That's who we really are. And so once we figure out what our soul is, then we can modify our body any way that we would like in order to make it reflect our soul. And, and that's why you get even past uh, gender identity into transhuman type things, you know, where, where people think that they're dogs or cats or other kinds of animals because their soul is telling them who they are and it doesn't match their body. And they've got the ability to change their body, so they, they should do that. And the church says, no, 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 to all of that. In the same way that Jesus was resurrected body and soul, um, we are embodied souls, and our bodies say something about who we are as a person. And someday when our bodies and our souls are joined together in heaven, uh, we will continue to be male and female. And, and you might ask, well, why is that important? Well, the, the theology of the body lays this out beautifully. And I, and I summarize a lot of it in the second chapter of the book, um, that if you go all the way back to Genesis and Adam and Eve in, in the garden, um, Adam was alone. And he wasn't actually alone because he was surrounded by all kinds of creatures that God had made, animals and birds and fish and, and things like that. Uh, but he didn't have a suitable partner, an azer, a, a helpmate. And sometimes with our 20th or I guess 21st century eyes now, we, we look back on that, that word helpmate and we think, oh, you know, that's just the church demeaning women because Adam needed a, a secretary or an assistant. Uh, but that's not what the word azer means at all. Uh, uh, the helpmate, the way the word azer is defined, is someone who is essential to helping you achieve your wholeness, to be the best possible person that you can be. And the Old Testament more than a dozen times refers to God himself as an azer. You know, so, so that tells you how important men and women are to each other. So God puts Adam to sleep and he produces Eve. And when they see each other, uh, they're naked. And Adam declares in great joy, at last, you know, this one is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. He recognizes that God has made him a true helpmate. But because she's naked, he would have known immediately 
that she was not the same as him, that God did not create another Adam so that there were two Adams in, in the garden. He would have recognized that their bodies were complementary. And that even though they had their own respiratory system, their own circulatory system, each one of them only had one half of a reproductive system. And so for, in order for them to be able to reach their fullest potential, they needed to be able to come together in a conjugal union. You know, we call it marriage. Um, and that when they do that as a, a gift to each other, just expressing love and, and giving every bit of themselves to the other, even their reproductive capacity, what can result from that is a third person, uh, a human child that needs its own name, a son or a daughter. It's the only time that we can co-create with God and make something out of nothing as opposed to just rearranging stuff that's already here. And what's so beautiful about that is that that image of the family and its maleness and, and femaleness and then the child mirrors or is an icon of the Trinity itself where God the Father uh, and Jesus, uh, God the Son, love each other so um, unconditionally that that love itself, from it proceeds a third person, the Trinity, you know, all, all one person, but yet three distinct persons, uh, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and so that's how the family mirrors it. And so if we reject our maleness and our femaleness, if we reject our ability to procreate and have children, we're rejecting ourselves as a model of who God is. We're rejecting the gift that God gave us. And, and then as, as Pope Francis talks about it, um, you know, in, in a number of different comments, including his encyclicals, when we reject our bodies, as the, the trans movement is asking us to do, we're rejecting the gift of the body that God created for us. And that when we, we do that, that separates us from God. And it also separates us from each other. Because if I can't authentically recognize who I am, including my body, I can't enter into a deep, meaningful, substantial relationship with another person. Uh, so embracing gender ideology means rejecting God's plan, re rejecting God's gift, and rejecting the, the two things that Jesus called us to do most, which was to love God and love neighbor. You know, so basically the entire plan of creation is just thrown out the window. And you might ask, well, you know, why do that? Well, it's because so much of modern culture has nothing to do with God and God's will and God's plan for our life, but it's all about what I want to do. I have the ability to create and control everything. I can manipulate the environment around me. I can even manipulate my body itself. I don't need God. This is all about me. You know, as Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. Um, and, and so there's just a complete disconnect between this movement and the church and who we're called to be as sons and daughters of Christ. Does sort of gender ID identity kind of fill that element of Gnosticism that the soul did in the past, sort of the sort of uh, the, the inner you? Yes, exactly. That, that the inner me knows that I'm male or female or two spirit or binary or queer or, you know, whatever the label you want to slap on it. Like I said, there's dozens and dozens of them. Um, and if that, that feeling about what my soul is doesn't match my body, because my body is just a shell, I'm, I'm free to change it in any way that I want. Um, and, and that's how we reject the gift that God gave us of our body. And there's no end. There's no possible, like, they're not going to stop at 250 or whatever. It's all incredibly personalized. Yeah, you know, with, with sex, it's easy because it's an objective, verifiable fact, uh, you know, being born male or female. You know, there, there's certain, you know, infinitely small percentages of people who are born with disorders of sexual development um, where it's difficult to tell if they're male or female. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's a spectrum of sex. It just means that they have a disorder in the same way that if I was born with a disordered kidney, you wouldn't say that I had a, a different kind of kidney. You would say that I had a sick kidney, you know, and it's, it's basically the same. So, you know, leaving that aside, um, you know, the sex is objective and verifiable. It's a fact at birth, not assigned. It's recognized. Uh, but whereas with the gender identity, it's entirely self-professed and can't be objectively verified by anyone. If I were to tell you that I was binary or that I was a woman, um, neither you nor any doctor could look at me, could examine me, could slice me up, could look at my brain and be able to tell that. Um, because as a, a matter of scientific fact, there is no such thing as a boy who's born in a girl's body or vice versa. The, the science has shown that that just doesn't exist. Um, you know, so it's entirely one of subjective profession. Um, and, and that's where we get into so much trouble. 
And so you're exactly right. There is no limit to that. Um, however I define myself, I can define myself. And it's not even limited to the sex that or the, the gender that I want to profess. If I think that I'm, I'm part animal or part something else, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm free to do that. And, and I don't say this to minimize in any way the distress that people with genuine gender dysphoria are experiencing. Like I said, it, it's a real mental health diagnosis. They have serious problems and suicide rates that are shockingly high even before they go through the transition. And that's why it's so important that we accompany individuals like that. Um, first and foremost, that we pray for them. Uh, but second of all, that we love them, not by affirming them, but by walking beside them and helping them work through their issues. Yeah, and there, indeed, yes, we need to we need to meet this with actual love, opposed to uh, you know what what they want, to, what they think love is, which is basically just um, I don't know. Ex well, they think love is specifically a feeling and not a choice, and exactly. they also and they also think that love is basically accepting what uh, the person's desire or what what they think is true self. Right. And, and here's the lie in that. I think every parent intuitively understands this, uh, that what you want isn't necessarily what's best for you. And so if I love someone and I'm willing what's best for them, that doesn't mean giving in to everything that they desire. So imagine that you're a parent of a small child and they really, really, really want to touch the hot stove. You would never let them do that, no matter how much they desire it, because as a parent, you understand something that they don't. The truth that when you touch a hot stove, you'll get burned and you could be seriously hurt. And, and so as parents, we can't just give, give in to what our kids profess or what they say they want or what they desire if we don't think that's what's best for them. That's not truly loving them. And, and so that's kind of where the rubber hits the road. And, and this idea of love, you know, it's so important. It undergirds all 10 chapters of, of the book. Um, and that's why it was important to us to have the word love in the title, loving God's children, the church and gender ideology, uh, because it, it was not just about rejecting the trans movement, but it's about embracing people who are struggling with gender dysphoria and leading them to a place where they can be the best possible version of themselves. And that is not a place where they reject their, their sexuality, where they identify as something different than their sex, um, but instead is getting them past whatever it was, if it was the physical abuse, if it was, uh, you know, a grandmother who dressed up the grandson as a girl because she really wanted a girl, if it was because of a broken relationship with a mother or father that that caused someone to have a, a distorted sense of what it means to be male or female. You know, there, there's so many underlying reasons why you would have that dysphoria. And, and those are all issues that that can be worked out through counseling or, or uh, you know, meetings with a psychologist or psychotherapist. And so it's critically important that we not reject, that we not mock, that we not demean, that we not bully, but instead we welcome and love in the true sense of the word love, the way that the church intends it, which is to will the best for that person by accompanying them. Indeed. You bring up this sort of this trope that comes on TV and movies, uh, one of the a very common trope is the sort of having a parent who only who maybe has only a daughter or only has a son and they basically expect that child to fill the fill the void of the desire that they wanted the opposite they wanted either a, a boy and they got a girl or they wanted a, a girl and got a boy and it, it's such an interesting thing that that's been a um a trope for so long what do you make of that well, I think all of those childhood issues are the types of things that need to be explored with a, a counselor. And I, I think that is probably one that would fall squarely in the bucket of something that could result in gender dysphoria down the road, um, you know, and, and including broken relationships too. Um, you know, sometimes you'll hear uh, detransitioners. Those are people who initially tried to transition to a, a different um, gender, even though that's not really possible, and then realized that that was a mistake and had harmed them. And so then they detransition -tra back and now they identify with their sex. Um, so, so you hear from them all kinds of these different stories. You know, I was the subject of abuse or my parent wanted a, a member of the opposite sex or, you know, a, a daughter who had a terrible relationship with her father, even if it wasn't just, you know, physical or sexual abuse, but, you know, some kind of a broken relationship. And so that caused her to want to be a male just to fill that maleness void in her life. You know, there, there's all kinds of these issues. Um, 
And, and if you're simply just handing someone a pill or trying to change their body, then you're not dealing with the underlying mental health issue. You're not dealing with the distress. Um, and, and that's what's so disturbing. And, and when you um, talk to the, the detransitioners, what you hear frequently from them is that they were rushed into this. You know, they, they had some anxiety, they had some discomfort, uh, they, they didn't feel like they were in the right body, and they went to a gender clinic, and they were almost immediately put on the pills, and then they were on their road to getting a surgery. And they were never told about the increase in suicide rates, they were never told about the higher incidence of mental health issues, they were never told that maybe their issues could be dealt with simply through counseling and working through childhood issues. You know, and, and the thing that, that should haunt all of us is you know, that the question, if someone transitioned and then came back to you years after the fact with the mutilated body, which they can never make whole again, and, and they say, why didn't you tell me? You know, you, you knew that this could happen and that there were other paths I could take that would be better for me. Why didn't you tell me? And that, that's the thing that should cause us to be courageous in speaking about these things and talking privately and publicly about the lie that is gender ideology and the love that is the the Catholic Church's view, which is accepting the body as the gift. Yeah, you talk, you you uh, sort of address this uh, this in the form for children in the form of uh, wanting to touch a hot stove, and the uh, adult says no. Uh, and but but as the child grows up, they don't want to touch the stove anymore for the most part. So why is like the persistent uh, persistence of a desire um, not an adult's true self? Uh, because desire is itself not truth. Um, you know, maybe people think it is, and, and that's one of the underlying problems. Um, actually, it's interesting you brought that up because the very first chapter of the book is about moral relativism. And you might ask, well, what does that have to do with gender ideology? Well, in a sense, it has everything to do with it. Uh, because either you believe that there is an objective truth that can be discerned and um, communicated to other people that we can all agree on, or unfortunately, more than 90% of our young people are moral relativists. You know, they believe that what's true for me is true for me. What's true for you is true for you. Um, and so there is no objective truth. And important issues like what is the meaning of the human body or what is the meaning of marriage or when does life begin such that we shouldn't abort it anymore? Um, those things all become matters of opinion. You know, like my favorite type of chocolate chip cookie or, or of cookie or my favorite type of ice cream. Um, and, and so for a moral relativist, a desire or a mere feeling, you know, might be their truth, but it's not the truth. And those of us who know that there is an objective truth can help those individuals and help their parents get past the desire to look at what's true about the human body. And what, what's truly unfortunate is that parents are being pressured to give in to feelings and desires rather than to give in to the truth. Uh, why, why would that be? Well, you know, the kid says to mom or dad, um, if you don't allow me to transition, I'm going to commit suicide. Or the, the doctor says to them, well, would you rather have a live son or a dead daughter? You know, and, and we, we know because of the high incidences of suicide among those um, experiencing gender dysphoria, that suicide is a risk and, and we need to act with love and compassion to try to prevent that from happening. But we also know from those long-term long studies that if we give in to that desire, if we give in to the feeling that the incidence of suicidal death actually increases. And so um, as parents, we can't give in to the desire. We can't give in to the demand. We can't give in to the feeling. And we certainly can't give in to the scare tactics. Yeah. So we shouldn't compromise, even though there's a, emotional blackmail in uh pharmaceutical incentivizing, you know, it, it's, you know, it's a big incentive for pharmaceuticals to sell these drugs and for clinics to do these, um, to do these, um, what is it called? Uh, uh, transitions or the surgery. surgeries. Surgeries. Yeah. Yes. They can charge as much as $70,000 for one of those surgeries. And then also now legally, you could be in trouble with the law if you don't go along with it. Right. In a state like California, uh, they consider a parent who declines to go along with their child's gender transition uh, to be abuse and neglectful. Um, and, and you can have your child taken away on that basis, um, which is just horrible. I mean, it's denying parental rights, but it's also denying the truth. Um, and it's definitely not in the best interests of the child. Yeah. I've heard that gender, the word was created in the 70s or 60s to uh, sort of 
to mean like, uh, I don't know, our st sort of stereotypes, basically, of what we assume men and women are or to be. So is, is that is that just a made up thing? Is gender just a way for us to a way for people to use this ideology to uh, confuse people? And like, how is it, you know, what's the difference between that and sex? Well, sex, again, is is the biological way that you can tell someone is male or female. You know, and we know that by the gametes they produce. We know it by their reproductive organs. We know it because of the chromosomes that are, are written onto every cell of their body. You know, so that, that's the basic meaning of sex. Um, the word gender has actually existed a, a lot longer than just the 1970s because it, it used to be a way of expressing masculinity or femininity of words. Uh, in English, we don't have this. Uh, yeah, there, there is no such thing as male words or female words. But if you studied, studied foreign languages, you quickly learn uh, that everything has a gender. So in French, la corbeille um, is a wastebasket. And the la tells you that it is a female word. Uh, but if you say um, le stylo, you know that that's, uh, I forget now if that's a pencil or a pen, but the le tells you that, that it's male. So this idea that gender somehow defines a feeling or, um, you know, a, a desire different than our sex comes out of John Money's research. He's the one who coined the phrase gender identity. And, and so it was just a, you know, a basically a medical scientific fraud um, on everybody that has been embraced by a movement now to describe something which has no medical significance. If, if there can be no such thing as a girl born in a boy's body or, or vice versa, um, then it doesn't make any sense to speak about someone's gender identity. Now, you might have people of different sexes who um, act or dress in certain ways that is more stereotypical of the other sex, and that's not inherently wrong. Um, you know, if you looked at, at, at two bell curves of males and females um, and how they, they acted, what their traits were, what their hobbies and interests were, you would actually see some overlap, you know, where they come together. And those are the places, you know, where, where the group girls want to play sports, they want to play baseball, or they want to play football. Or you might have a, a boy who's very emotional and very empathetic and likes to play domestic things when they're, they're a child and you know playing house and things like that. That doesn't mean that the, the boy is a girl or that the girl is a boy. It just means that the way that they express their maleness or femaleness falls on a different place on that curve. And we shouldn't criticize that. We shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, you know, if, if your, your boy is empathetic, that's a really good thing. It means they would probably make a really good priest and a really good husband. Um, but, but this notion of gender identity being separate from the body uh, is, is what gets people off course. And that's what the movement is designed to do. Yes, very, very good. It, it's, it's important for a lot of people, uh, especially people who aren't in very high leadership positions, to, to see, uh, you know, leaders taking on this difficult task of combating gender ideology. Of course, it's important for anybody to defend the church's teaching, no matter how small it is. But could you give some examples of, of just leadership? How are, the lead, how are our leaders combating gender ideology? Well, increasingly, we're seeing from our church leadership a willingness to speak out on this issue. Um, I, I mentioned the Vatican document for educators um, Pope Francis in encyclicals and public comments has also been very strong on this issue, really uncompromising. Um, he expresses disbelief and shock that we're teaching children as young as kindergarten uh, that they could choose their gender and it can be different than their sex. Um, if, if you focus more on the United States, um, first, our bishops have been very outspoken on this. Um, I cite uh, from a number of bishops' documents in the book to help people understand what the U.S. Church is saying on this issue. And just recently, the USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, clarified that Catholic hospitals should not be engaging in the, the mutilation of bodies for the purposes of transitioning someone to a different gender. I mean, Catholic hospitals just should not be doing that. Um, kind of moving away from church officials, we see uh, government representatives in different states starting to take a stand on this. Um, I think about a dozen states now have passed laws that prohibit um, any of the, the gender transition drugs or surgeries on minors. Um, we've also seen 22 states adopt laws to save women's sports by requiring that all sports teams be assigned based on sex, not on gender identity. So you don't have the situation like in Connecticut a few years ago 
where two boys who identified as girls took 15 state track and field titles that otherwise would have gone to girls. Um, you know, so we see it happening there too. Um, you see it with some businesses and, and parents who are standing up and speaking up publicly on policies and going to court if necessary. Uh, businesses that are being forced to ignore gender identity and their hiring and things like that are, are suing states or local governments that are compelling them to do that. Or, or a, a fast growing area, unfortunately, um, involves parents standing up to schools that have these reprehensible policies that allow counselors and teachers at school to transition kids while keeping it a secret from the, the parents. They'll, they'll use the sex-based pronouns with the parents while using the preferred pronouns at school to keep the parents in the dark so they don't know about what's being done to their kids at school. Um, so, so these brave families and, and businesses and others are starting to stand up, speak out, and go to court when necessary. And you know, for, for all of us, we may not be called uh, to, to be church leaders, we may not be called to be politicians, we may not even be called to bring a lawsuit, uh, but it's our job to get educated about these issues and to talk to our kids, talk to our extended family, talk to our friends and neighbors, uh, talk to our coworkers so that everybody understands. And as I mentioned at the outset, that's what the book is all about. Loving God's Children, the Church and Gender Ideology is kind of the soup to nuts guide so that you can talk about the theology, you can talk about uh, the natural philosophy, you can talk about the science, you can talk about media and government, and you can answer common questions that people have. Like, what do I do if my child tells me that they think they're the opposite sex? Or if I'm a priest, what do I do? And someone who has got a trans identity um, presents themselves for marriage or the RCIA program, um, that this book will help all of those people in all those contexts to be able to speak the truth with love. Yes, indeed. We only scratched the surface of, of this topic. And, you know, the the book's not that long, necessarily. It's just it, it's got a lot of information and uh, it, it's very useful. And I hope everyone who's listening goes out, uh, clicks the link to Sophia Institute Press and buys this book. Uh, thank you, John Birch, for coming on the show. Uh, uh, please like, share, comment and subscribe. Anything else before we go, John? Um, go out there and build God's kingdom. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And God bless.